when we are working in Revit, especially when you are learning Revit, one of the nice things to have is some kind of background image to be modeling over the top of. As you progress, you'll need less of that, um, but a lot of times it's really convenient to either have a hand drawing or a sketch, or if you're working on an as-built, being able to bring something in as a background image so that we can start modeling over the top of it. So let's, we're gonna start by doing that. The problem with doing it this way is the first thing that we have to do is get things to a scale. So remember that, like we're bringing in a raster image, a JPEG image, it's not going to come in at a specific scale, right? So we have to start establishing those things. So I'm going to go to insert an import image, and I am going to grab the floor plan image of Cliff House. So Cliff House ground floor and I'm going to left click to place it. And then I'm actually gonna move that image just a little bit over to the side. Um, because this is one of those things where again, zero, zero, zero in Revit is at the intersection of, if, you, if I were to draw an imaginary line between these elevation tags. And it's, it's going to play out nicer later if I am modeling close to zero, 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 especially if we push things to twin motion or Lumion or wherever, okay? Uh, things are just gonna be much easier to work with. So I know that my scale is a little bit wonky, um, although this is deceptive because it's close, but if I measure the width of this door, uh, it's coming in roughly at four feet. And the more you do, uh, the more you get into architecture stuff, um, the more you'll be able to intuit your way through the scale of these things and what they should be. But I, I'm quite certain that that is not right. Now, all that said, I am definitely still guessing at what the scale of this thing is. Um, but I, you know, I did a little bit of calculating this morning, and I think I'm pretty close to understanding out to out dimension on this residence is 42 feet okay plus or minus a foot probably um and when we're scaling something one of the worst things you could do is like use a very small dimension like a lot of times you will have a graphical scale something like that and when i have a graphical scale if i'm scaling something to, to become one-to-one -one in a program like revit i'm going to use the graphical scale unless it's again super small but even something like a door, like if I zoom in on this, uh, those pixels are not reliable at this point. Um, you know, so I could be off, you know, I can measure the width of a pixel. I mean, that's an inch plus or minus. So I'm always looking for something like out to out on a building. What is a known dimension that I have? Uh, the largest dimension that is something that I can feel like I can rely on as a known quantity is what I want to use because that's going to reduce my error in terms of the accuracy. So um, the assumption that I've made after doing a little bit of looking is out to out on this, outside of wall to outside of wall is approximately 42 feet, okay? So to do that, to scale this correctly, I'm going to go to annotate and detail line. And I'm going to go outside edge right here. I'm just gonna draw a line. I'm gonna make it pretty big, send it right over there, okay? And then I'm going to go to a modify and offset. And I'm going to offset that line by 42 feet. Okay, so I've got my line drawn. I've gone to modify, offset, and in this box right here, I'm putting 42 feet. So offset is simply going to throw a line one side or the other based on where I click, okay? So if I hover over one side of that line or the other, you can see a dashed line before I left click in terms of where it's going to put my line, okay? So I'm going to offset that down 42 feet, left click. Next, I need to take this line and I'm going to copy it. And I'm going to copy it by starting a left click here at the base. 
And then I'm going to place that copy right here at the edge of that outside of the outside of my wall. Okay? So that gives me three lines. And essentially you can think about those three lines as this. 42 feet is what I want, right? That's the dimension that I want this wall to become, right? Outside of wall to outside of wall. So this long wall on this edge, I want that to become 42 feet, right? This line right here to this line, this, this to this, that is what I have, okay? So I'm going to take what I have and shrink it to what I want. So to do that, I'm going to select the image and I'm going to select scale. Then I'm going to use the end point of that outside line. This becomes my base point. Okay, so I'm going to left click here. I'm going to go to what I have, which is 56 feet and five inches. Left click. And then I'm going to turn that into what I want by left clicking again on the end point of the line that I set at 42 feet. So I'm turning what I have into what I want. Cool, you guys kind of with me? All right, once I have that, I can delete those lines. And again, what I'm going to do is I'm going to again just kind of nudge this down. I'm just using the arrow keys on my laptop to move that back around to the approximate center. Okay, so the first thing that um, I want to model today, and then we're going to have a little bit of work time um, the rest of the class today is simply modeling out a couple of these structural components. So let's go back to our website and let's look at Cliff House here. Let's go back a few or two. So there's this great framing system right here with these cross beams. So I've got this big I beam or W section coming back this way. I've got a brace here and I've got this coming down with this X bracing between the two, okay? So we're gonna dive into modeling those, and then I'm basically gonna give you time to kind of go back and work through some of these things, answer questions, rest of the class day to day. Cool? So we're not gonna worry about modeling the walls, stuff like that yet. We might get started on that Wednesday. We'll just see how it all plays out. So I know these things are happening below level one floor plan, right? Um, and we just want to go ahead and model. And there, you're, you're essentially going to have to adjust those to your site that you've selected that you're starting to build up in twin motion. Everybody has a slightly different slope that they're going to deal with. And we'll just kind of have to do that on a one by one basis in class. But let's dive into getting a start on these beams, okay? So inside of Revit, those are my beams. Let's check, take a look at that again on the floor plan, right? So you can see that beam, that is actually continuing all the way up and all the way up. I wonder if we can see if they have an interior shot of those. Yeah, okay. So see that right here? Those beams are the exact same beams right here. Okay, so that's what we want to start with our model. Okay, so inside of Revit, there's my beams. Um, and as you can see, this is where um, I am limited by the quality of my raster image. So there's going to be some guesswork and some common sense work on this. But to model those, to start modeling those, again, in an office, perhaps you're going architecture, component, and you are going to go to load family, and you are going to go to structure, structural columns. Right? That would be often what you're going to be doing in an office. That's really not the right way to start learning Revit. Okay? Um, it's going to leave, for starters, it's going to leave like a gap between columns and beams for your structural engineer to do the design work on those connections. 
in terms of building graphics, like we need you to in school to communicate your design ideas. Um, you need to use the massing model so you can actually bring those things together and show how they're going to work. Working through those gaps and trying to, to jump forward to that level of thinking in Revit, not, not a real easy thing. So what we're going to do instead is we're going to go to component and model in place. And then we are going to scroll down to generic models. Now, there are some things, again, that this is a pretty advanced tool set. Um, like if I scroll down, you will see there is um, a structural columns family category which would make sense to put these things into. But again, that is not going to behave the way you're going to think it's going to behave by default. For instance, if I were to put this, what we're getting ready to model, into the structural columns category of family, those are not going to show up in elevations. I think they'll show up in plans, maybe. Um, probably won't show up in sections in our architectural drawings, because often those structural columns are hidden in walls. So the assumption that Revit's going to make is those should be hidden elements. So you have to learn, you have to be thinking like Revit and going in and say, okay, I'm going to unhide those elements. And yeah, so it's easier to just stick with generic until you're a Revit Jedi, okay? Once this stuff really starts to make sense and you're in an office and you're working, collaborating, then like categorizing these things starts to really pay off. But for now, keep it simple, generic models. 99 times out of 100, working as a student, I want you to place these in generic models. So I'm going to say OK to that. Um, and the naming convention, even the naming convention, as a student, it's not going to matter. So you can just say OK. It's really rare for, rare for me to say a naming convention doesn't matter. Okay, usually I'm saying name your views, name your layers, all that stuff. So this switches my ribbon um, over to the custom component modeling tools. And the extrusion is about, oh, I don't know, maybe nine times out of 10, eight times out of 10, what you're going to be doing. And this is pretty simple. I'm going to trace out this uh, I-beam here. So eight inches, that seems about right. Kind of like it. Um, three quarters of an inch thick, that seems about right. So I'm going to start out like that. And then I'm going to draw a line center to the outside edge. And I'm going to copy outside edge to outside edge. And, you know, I drew those at three quarters of an inch thick. So we need to do, I'm going back to, I, I need to give this center line some thickness. So I'm going to offset it um, half of three quarters of an inch both directions. Okay. So I'm going to offset um, 0.75 inches. And this is where we play a little bit of geometry games, okay? So if you notice, I went offset. That's my center line. I went three quarters of an inch this way, three quarters of an inch this way. Who can tell me what half of three quarters of an inch is off the top of the head really fast? Three eighths. Three eighths? Yeah, I, sh I should have totally done three eighths, but my mind doesn't work that way. Thanks, Mark, for proving my theory wrong. Because my mind doesn't do three eighths very well, I just plan with the geometry of it. So essentially, if I offset three quarters of an inch, do a line between those two, I can then go center point, center point, and then erase the parts that I don't want because I'm no good at math fast. Yeah, three eighths would have made more sense if I offset those three eighths of an inch from the center line. But so I'm constantly playing sort of with the geometry of the thing. Yeah. So I don't know what's different about mine. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So if you are seeing super, super thick lines, there's a little button right here called thin lines. And if I do that, you can see why sometimes you want thin lines, thick lines turned off and on, right? So it's a great question. If you are seeing something that's like, oh, that's really hard to read, 
It's a little button right here that's going to toggle your line weights on and off. Okay, so at an eighth inch scale, trying to draw this, um, uh, well, it's it's really it's really difficult. That's all I can say. Yeah, so that's where I'm going to toggle this. If I'm working with a high level of precision, something like an I beam, yeah, I need that. Great question. Okay, so I'm going to delete these little extra lines. And now I need to go ahead and trim this together to make this um, a continuous loop, okay? So I'm going to go to um, my drawing tools, which are right here. I'm going to go split, and I'm going to split this line and this line. I'm going to go trim from this to this, this to this, this to that, this to that. So what I'm left with, and I'm going to hide this. You do, you do not, as you're following along, you do not need to hide the image here. Oh, I can't hide the image because I'm in, I'm uh, building a custom component. I'm in the family editor. So let's, let's talk about that really quick. When you build a family inside of Revit, you're essentially building an object that's nested into your Revit scene. So right now, I can't edit anything. Like, I can't select that image in my background anymore because I'm only working on this piece, that little piece of information, okay? Um, this I-beam that I have, it's set to be one foot tall right now. Um, so again, my properties are um, for the family, not for the view at this time. So I know that I have these lines to make this family. And currently it's going to only be one foot tall, which is kind of ridiculous. So I'm at least going to set that to 12. And I'm going to green checkbox it to make that extrusion. And then I'm going to take a look at this in 3D. So top left of center is your default 3D view. And you'll be able to see that we've got an I-beam created. Now currently we're still editing that family. So I can say finish model and that gets me back to my base Revit C. Okay, so I'm gonna stop the recording so that way it doesn't record us backing up through this again. But I'm going to work through that one more time, make sure everybody's on the same page. Cool?